Hi everybody, Bearded Rogue here, and uh, I'm recording my question and answer video that I mentioned last week. Thank you to everyone who sent questions in. Uh, I really, really super uh, appreciate it. Um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and go through what I have, and um, and uh, I'll answer all of the questions that I have, um, and we'll go from there. So. Uh, my first question is from Sister Ectoplasm, and it's, what was the first game you ever bought? Um, and this one's actually um, a two-part answer. So, the first game that I personally ever bought uh, was the original Pandemic, uh, the one with the wood cubes. That um, I picked up... Uh, after getting back into the hobby, um, that was the my my entrance back into board gaming as an adult. Um, as far as the first game I ever got as a kid, um, I'm trying to think. There were so many. I know uh, I was very big into Popomatic Trouble. I know I was very big into uh, Uno. But um, I'm not sure exactly what my first game as a kid was. Um, I know that I grew up in a house where uh, Pinochle and Spades and Hearts and Solitaire and all of that stuff was pretty common. So probably a deck of cards, I would have to say. Um, and one of those many games. I know I remember playing Crazy Eights like crazy with my grandmother. Um, so, but as far as the first game... Uh, hobby game I ever bought was Pandemic. Um, what's the most recent game design that you've worked on? That one's tough because I'm working on about 10 designs right now. Um, all of which started at various different times and kind of I shuffle through them one after another um, in order to keep myself interested and to keep myself working. If I ever hit a roadblock on one of my designs, then I shift to another one and uh, start working on that. I would say the most recent game that we've designed, if you go by just the initial prototype and creation, um, is uh, Kick-Ass and Chew Bubblegum, which is a They Live uh, game. Um, all of our, uh, I've worked on other games more recently, um, but it's the first game design that, or it, it's the most recent game design that's uh, shown up. We've um, created uh, several other games that we've worked on. I've been working on Dice Heroes in the background. I've been revamping Build the Robots, but both of those designs uh, are revamps and they predate uh, Kick-Ass and Chew Bubblegum. So that's the most recent design that I've worked on. Um, Game Geek Ninja asks, uh, "How did you feel that becoming a game, or how do you feel that becoming a game creator or developer has changed the way you evaluate a new game? Is there a different mindset?" Um, yes and no. One of the reasons why I've gotten into game design is because I've always kind of looked at games from this perspective, mechanics, mechanisms, whatever you want to call them have always been very interesting to me. Um, I come from a CCG role-playing-esque background, uh, and so uh, mechanisms are, are what kind of fascinate me, how things work. Uh, it's the same way in my, my day job, uh, I do IT stuff. Um, how things work fascinates me. So. I've always kind of evaluated games from that kind of perspective where being a creator, a game creator has changed is now instead of just looking at how does the mechanism work, there's a second level to it and it's what is the mechanism trying to achieve. So it's not just, you know, oh, well, that's pretty cool. How does that thing work? And figuring out how it works and why now it's it's why it works the way it does and what the designer is trying to accomplish with it. Um, whether they're trying to, you know, is it a balancing mechanism 
for uh, players of different skill levels? Is it a randomizing mechanism in order to uh, create more variety in gameplay modes? Um, is it an incentivizing mechanism? Like, is it directly created as an incentive to get players to take the actions that the designer wants them to take? Um, what kind of experience is the designer looking to create with each mechanism inside of the game? Um, theme is similar. Theme has always been separate from mechanisms for me. Not like they aren't integrated. I love great themes and I love integrating them. And I love unusual themes. Um, but the theme usually either interests me or it doesn't. Um, there's very little that's going to rope me in on a theme that doesn't interest me. Now, there's all sorts of themes that interest me. Like, Lotus, to me, is a fascinating theme because it's different and novel. You know, uh, the first zombie game I ever saw was interesting to me, but after that it kind of got to be a little bit old hat. So, like, new themes are what grab me. Things that are different than the standard sci-fi, fantasy, zombie, pirate, stuff. Um, you know, I want to see more modern day themes. I want to see more, um, more mad scientist games that aren't take that games, even though that seems to be what everybody wants the genre to be thematically. Um, that's just new themes interest me. Themes that are different interest me. Themes that are unique interest me. Um, but mechanisms and what the mechanisms are trying to accomplish are really, um, are really what's there for me. And the most recent one is, is theme mechanism match. So take Mad Scientist as an example. A lot of people expect a Mad Scientist game to be a take that game. That's just what they expect. They expect it to be silly, goofy. They don't expect it to be a thinky resource management planning type game. Um, which is one of the problems I've run into in Build the Robots, um, is that it's got a mad scientist theme on top of it, but it's very much a engine building resource management type of game. Um, so there's a bit of a, a theme mismatch there, and I'm looking into that to see if maybe, uh, changing the theme will spice it up a bit. Maybe even, uh, maybe even make it a better game in general, just examining that. And so that's one of the things I'm constantly doing with my designs is trying to, to take a look at what's out there. Um, so let's see. Uh, Sparks J, when's the last time you got lost in a game? So this one's interesting to me because most of the board games that I play um, don't draw me in on that level. Uh, it's more of a like a director's stance where I'm like standing over kind of directing the traffic that's occurring on the board it's not really sucking me in as much um but uh i will say that like role-playing games really do that for me um i played a campaign of uh, don't rest your head which is a, an independent role-playing game about people who develop superpowers because they stop sleeping and they gain the ability to interact with the the realm of dreams and nightmares and all of this stuff and it's a a very weird game but that game really like pulled me into it in a way that i haven't had in a long time um Tech Noir uh, is another indie game that was actually my first ever backed kickstarter um, it really sucked me in. I'm a very big fan of the, like, immediate future, um, cyberpunk type aesthetic. Um, whether dystopian or utopian, like, that really interests me. Not like the, the far future, but the, you know, just, you know, a couple, you know, 20, 30 years down the road. That kind of future really interests me. Uh, to see where p people or where authors think that our current problems are going to take us or what current technologies are going to move in a different direction. So um, I definitely say, uh, say Tech Noir and Don't Rest Your Head. Um, the most recent game to just pull me in a whole hog and make me want to uh, have everything to do with it is Worldwide Wrestling. Um, I actually did a video on it a little while back, but I'm a big wrestling fan, and um, it's 
it, it like as a role playing game it is wrestling like it really captures to me the essence of wrestling of players taking on the roles of wrestlers who are working together to entertain a crowd like it's not about your individual advancement or progression although all of those things are part of the story and make up the background it's all about entertaining the crowd and about that um portion of things which is what wrestling really is like it's not an actual athletic contest it is an athletic event but you're not really competing you're working together it has more in common with a um a dance routine or a gymnastics a team-based gymnastics event um or filming a movie you know they're live action stuntmen um, and worldwide wrestling totally captures that. Like it greatly encourages players to work together. Um, you know, you can subvert creatives booking, but, um, if everybody works together to put on a great show, everybody's going to get rewarded. Um, as they do it, everybody gets rewarded for putting each other over or for creating feuds where they go back and forth. Even the matches, uh, dictate that one person has control and passes control to the other person. Like, I've never seen a narrative game where someone willfully passes control to someone else before they've run out of ideas. Like, normally it's, I talk, I talk, I talk, I talk, I talk, and then, you know, it ends when I have nothing else left to say. In this case, it's, I talk, I talk, I talk, hey, that's my part of this match, now let's see what you do so that I can build off of that. It creates a back-and-forth improv nature that really feels like wrestling to me. So, yeah, those are um, probably the, the games that I've gotten lost in. Like I said, ro uh, board games really don't, they really don't suck me in like that. Like, I tend to be a much more of a director-level person. Um, there are lots of games that I've derived a lot of enjoyment from recently, but uh, role-playing games are really where I go to get that kind of a fix. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, what's next? Um, Eric Buscemi asks, uh, which of your designs do you feel is the most polished? Um... At this point, that's also kind of a toss-up. I would say it's either my beat-em-up game, um, which is uh, rock solid in my opinion. Um, it's just ready to go. It, it, you know, it's currently with a publisher for evaluation. They're looking at it. Um, it's it's done. Uh, the other one is Fire in the Library, which is also with a publisher for evaluation and. Fire in the Library, I feel, has, has been iterated on a whole bunch. We've observed a lot of player interactions. It's a 10-minute game, uh, so it's really easy to get a lot of plays in and to really get a lot of um, feedback from people. Most people are willing to sit down and play a 10-minute game. Um, they may not be willing to sit down and play an hour-long game, but a 10-minute game, you can get almost anybody to play. And uh, the observations of more and more and more people have really helped that one get fleshed out uh, in a very good way. So um, I think beat em up is the most polished. I think um, that Fire in the Library has benefited the most from playtesting. Um, which has changed the most since conception? Um, <laughs> at this point... Man, I don't even know how many iterations Build the Robots has. Dice Heroes also has a lot of iterations. Um, so it's one of those two. Um, Dice Heroes has mostly been um, mechanisms uh, changing and uh, numbers changing and balancing. And it's a really uh, probably over-ambitious design idea for where I'm at in my design career. But... Uh, I really, really want it to work. I really like the the core mechanic that the players engage in. Um, the dungeons themselves have been more of a work in progress. The, the idea of dice drafting was something that came out right at the beginning. The idea of players having abilities where you draft the dice to activate them, that's been in there since the beginning. Um, and those are the things that I'm absolutely enamored with and... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, are, are pretty damn good the way they are. The dungeons themselves and the numbers and how powerful they are compared to the heroes, that's been a constant change. And then um, Build the Robots has gone through I don't even know how many iterations. Um, it's changed from a 
deck builder to a hand builder. It went from having single-use cards to multi-use cards. It went from being an area control game to being an engine building game. It's just kind of been all over the place. So it's definitely had the most changes. Um, uh, next question is, what's changed the least? Um, probably beat em up um, My beat em up game... Uh, as initially conceived, was pretty damn good right out the gate. Um, the only change that we made, really, was to make it so that each player deck focuses on a specific icon, rather than having all of the player decks be identical. Um, it's still the same equal distribution of everything, um, but uh, having each player focus on a particular thing gave players more ownership, over it and and really made it much easier to to like throw out um things for other people to do so like it's a real-time game and every card has two sections a top and a bottom and you can use either card for its top its bottom or both if it matches identically you're trying to match the symbols on it to the symbols on one of the enemies and so giving each player a symbol that's on every single one of their cards really means that when that symbol comes up on an enemy their laser focus is drawn to it instead of everybody just kind of going which one of us has it now it's much clearer who uh, who needs to, to jump on point, and that's really important in a real-time game. But it's definitely the one that's changed the least because that's the only real change we've made at all through the whole process. Um, which is my favorite design? This is really tough. Like, it's really a painful decision to choose amongst your babies. Um... All of them have things that I like about the most. Uh, I would say my favorite mechanism right now is the assembly line from Build the Robots. Um, that's by far my favorite. Um, I love dice drafting. I love the uh, the speed matching and built in um, beat 'em up. Um, I really like pulling stuff from a bag in Fire in the Library. Um, the games that I've designed have kind of been a greatest hits of mechanisms that I enjoy. Uh, so. But, but Build the Robots assembly line is definitely my favorite mechanism. Um, as far as the, my, my favorite game, I think that's, um, my favorite whole game is much more of a toss-up. I really like my beat-em-up game. Um, I really like the fact that you can play the whole game in, like, 10 to 15 minutes, and it's frantic, it gets your heart pumping, it really feels like you're... Uh, trying to navigate one of those old school action arcade games um, without mimicking any of the mechanics. It like captures the feel without being a simulation of the same thing. And that's one of the things that I really love about it. Um, who's my favorite designer? And in parentheses here, why is it Bruno Cathala? Um... I can't say that it's Bruno Cathala. Um, I haven't played a Bruno Cathala game that I don't like yet, but I haven't played very many, honestly. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know if uh, I had been exposed to more Bruno Cathala. If I would fall in love and he would be my favorite designer right now. That's a tough one. Um, the. My favorite designer, as far as variety goes, is probably Antoine uh, Boza. Um, every single one of his games feels different, um, whether it's a super hard co-op like Ghost Stories or a um, the drafting of Seven Wonders or the super chill yet cutthroat mechanisms of Takedo or hanging out with a panda in Takanoko or, um, you know, just any of his games like he designs like super difficult co-ops and chill um strategic games that that are um easy for people to pick up and just play like i can play takaido or takanoko or seven wonders with most people that i know um whether they're gamers or not none of those games are are overly complex or head scratching uh from that perspective and so i would say for variety's sake, he's definitely my favorite. I would say 
Um, as far as the designer whose games most consistently uh, hit my buttons, I would say Brad Talton from Level 99 Games. Um, I, I love the Battlecon system. Um, it's absolutely, hands down, my favorite two-player game. Um, as far as, like, if I could play any two-player game over and over again for the rest of my life, it would be Battlecon. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the people that I play with don't agree. I like a lot of two-player games, but it's at the top of the list. Um, and at the same time, he has things like Noir, which is a really super cool deduction game that has multiple different ways that you can play it. Um, and Millennium Blades, which is one of the most ambitiously crazy things I have ever seen in gaming. Like, when he first mentioned it to me, I wasn't even sure how he was going to pull it off. Like, I was very skeptical. I didn't say that to his face because I wanted to see him succeed, but I was very skeptical that he could do it, and then I played it, and, uh, yeah. Uh, succeeded beyond my wildest imagination, so... Uh, I would say that, that uh, Brad Talton is probably... Uh, he has yet to create a design that isn't a hit with me. Um, let's see, what's next? Um, if you could freely use any IP for a design, what would you pick? Um, well, uh, Ninja Turtles would be number one. Um, number two uh right now is they live uh those two obviously i'm working on designs based on both of them so that's partly why i say that but both of those are really big ones um but if i could pick any uh ip for a design um i'd love to do something with the uh avatar universe avatar the last airbender avatar the legend of korra that universe i i love everything about that universe um and i'd love to do something in it um let's see i'm i'm a huge fan of the android universe actually um i know i'm never going to be able to design a game in it, uh, since it's FFG, Asmodee, Giant Behemoth, but, um, when I got Technoir, the game I mentioned earlier, what my original intention for it was, was to run a role-playing game in the Android, uh, universe. At that time, just Android the board game, not even Android Netrunner, which has now fleshed out the universe even more, and now they've got this amazing book, uh, that covers different things in the world and everything, so... Um, I would say the Android property is one that I'm super into because it's a, uh, uh, I won't say more realistic take, but it's a less dystopian take on the cyberpunk genre. Um, you know, humanity isn't completely beaten down. The corporations are just as scary, but there's, uh, multiple other things going on in the world that means that it's not, uh, puppet masters controlling everybody from behind the scenes. Um... And for, for random IPs that I think would be amazing, uh, video game-wise, that I would love to see as games, Invisible Ink, uh, System Shock, Deus Ex, um, those are some of my favorite video games of all time. Doom is going to be getting another game. Um, I One of my biggest misses in the hobby was missing the first Doom game. This new one I'm really looking forward to, but... Yes, the System Shock universe, uh, the Deus Ex universe, obviously both cyberpunk-type futuristic settings, um, those, would be, those would be amazing. Um, and Invisible Ink is a similar bent, but it's a uh, heist game. And I just, I love that near-future setting. So um, any of those IPs would be awesome. Um... And my last question on here from Eric is, when are you coming to New York to show me your games? That's a darn good question. I don't know when I'm coming to New York next. Um, it's not anything that's on my calendar right now. Um, I unfortunately have a full-time day job and a toddler and uh, all sorts of other things. So the conventions that I can make it to, which right now are Origins, Gen Con, and BGG Con... Um, are pretty much as stretched as I can be right now. Um, I'm looking at next year. It, it'll Part of it will depend on what happens with BGGCon. If they split BGGCon into two separate conventions, 
uh, in the same week, then I probably won't go to BGG Con because the whole point of BGG Con for me is that everybody I want to see will be there rather than, uh, you know, half of the people that I want to see. Um, so that one may fall off of my list. Uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens there. Um, I'm not really a big fan of Gen Con, but if you want to be in the industry, you have to go to Gen Con. Um, Origins will be on my list in perpetuity. I will always go to Origins and Unpub uh, as well in Baltimore. So I will definitely be at Unpub in Baltimore in March, um, which is about as close to New York as I'm getting on based on my current schedule. But that doesn't mean that things won't change. We'll see. Um, but right now my convention season is pretty booked up. I'm doing like one a quarter. And so uh, that's... Um, that's pretty uh pretty big as far as conventions go. Um let's see here. Uh the last two questions I have, um the people who asked them wanted to remain anonymous. Um one of them is uh how do you like being on the Breaking into Board Games podcast? Um I love it. I love podcasting. Podcasting is awesome. Um it's something I never, ever would have considered. Uh, obviously, I'm somebody who can talk because this is approaching a 30-minute video. But uh, it's um, something that I really love doing. And I really love highlighting uh, people in this industry. The people in this industry are amazing. Um, and giving them a bit of a spotlight makes me very, very happy. Um so many people work so hard as like second jobs or you know <laughs> third jobs or for little pay or out of the kindness of their heart to try to bring fun to other people and so being able to highlight those people and and put a spotlight on them and what they do uh is something that I personally really enjoy um and uh the last question here is if you could co-design a game with anyone, who would it be? And uh, this one's really tough because uh, I have so much respect for the people in this industry who design games that uh, I'd be hard-pressed to pick just one. Um, if I wanted my first game to sell out nearly instantly, I would say uh, Eric Lang or Rob Davio. That would be awesome. Um, if I had to pick someone who seems like a really interesting dude uh, and who seems to have some pretty clever creative ideas, I would say Kevin Wilson, actually. Um, like he designed the Android game. He did a lot of work with Fantasy Flight that was really neat. And uh, most of the stuff that he's put out since then has been really intriguing. Um, I really, uh, really enjoy his stuff. And while he's not, um, not someone who likes to go out to all of the conventions all the time and I have yet to meet him, um, I would love to be able to design a game with him. I think it would be, um, it would be super fun because he's, really really cool and really smart um it would be kind of like working with one of my idols but um that's it that's uh the questions that i have i hope uh that this was entertaining and enjoyable for you guys i really loved doing this um i'm glad i got so many questions um if i had gotten any more i would have had to cut this into multiple episodes i'm sure uh, but, um, thank you guys again, anybody who watches these, anybody who interacts with me, anybody who talks to me on Twitter, anybody who plays my games or expresses any interest in my games or my vlogs or anything. Um, I love all of you guys and, uh, I really appreciate the support that this community has offered me. So, um, with that, Bearded Rogue out.